And ladies and gentlemen, we begin with the session. Are we all ready? Can I hear a nice loud round of applause? Wonderful. <laughs> Wonderful. May I please call on stage Vice Chairperson of the India Today Group, Kali Puri, to begin our next session. And please put your hands together as I invite our guest for the evening, best-selling author Yuval Noah Harari. Please put your hands together to welcome Kali and Yuval. Welcome. Good evening. I hope you guys have had a very happy, happy hour. Because a little intoxication is needed for this next session. War is obsolete. You're more likely to die by committing suicide than in conflict. Famine is over. You're more likely to die over eating than by starvation. Death is just a technical problem. Immortality is in. Forget about computers. Humans can be hacked. In fact, in 200 years, there will be no humans. And ladies and gentlemen, this is just the teaser for his book. Shocking predictions such as these about our future have made Professor Yuval Harari a global rage. His two best-selling books, Sapiens and Homer Deus, have been published in 40 different languages and are quoted widely by intellectuals and world leaders alike. He has a PhD in history from Oxford, but he's a historian who predicts the future. So I'm really not sure what Oxford's doing in the history department there. I'm especially happy to welcome him to the conclave because he believes it's the human ability to believe and tell stories, a common network of stories that makes us special to other living beings. It's our human spark our secret source. It's what makes us superior to other living beings. And journalists, at the heart of it all, are actually storytellers. So making a couple of jumps, I've decided what he's really saying is that media and journalists are what makes humanity tick. And you know, media needs all the support these days. So thank you, Yuval. I now have the great pleasure of inviting Professor who has traveled to the future and come back to tell the tale to deliver his keynote address. So hello, everybody. Let me just make friends with this computer, and I'll be with you in a moment. Yes, so what I want to talk to you today is about the role of nationalism and nations in the world of the 21st century. Until a short time ago, it seems that nationalism was waning and that humankind is on a path to becoming a single, global, peaceful community. But now, nationalism is making a comeback. And not just in some remote corners of the world, but also in the hegemonic powers of Western Europe, of North America, of Russia, China, and India. What does the revival of nationalism signify? Does nationalism offer real solutions to the unprecedented problems of the 21st century? Or is it a kind of escapist indulgence that might doom 
humankind and the entire ecosystem to disaster. Before addressing this question, we need to dispel a very widespread myth. Contrary to what many people think, nationalism is not a natural and eternal part of the human psyche or of human biology. It's actually a very, very recent evolutionary development. Yes, Homo sapiens is a social animal by nature, but for millions of years, until about 5,000 years ago, humans lived in small, intimate communities in which everybody knew everybody else. Only in the last 5,000 years or so did small clans and tribes unite to form larger and larger groups until they formed large nations comprising millions of strangers. Whereas the basic characteristic of the ancient clans and tribes was that they were intimate communities. Everybody really knew everybody else. Nations are communities of strangers. You don't know most other people in your nation. I don't know the eight million other people who share my Israeli citizenship. You don't know the 1.2 or 1.3 billion people who share your Indian citizenship. They are your brothers and sisters and friends only in the imagination. So if nationalism and nations are not natural to humans, why and how did they appear? They appeared not, not a long time ago because nations can solve large-scale problems that small tribes cannot solve. And nations can utilize large-scale opportunities that small intimate clans cannot utilize. The first big groups of people, kingdoms and nations, appeared about four to 5,000 years ago in the Indus Valley, the Nile Valley, the Euphrates Valley, and the Yellow River Valley. Until that point, those river valleys were populated by many small independent tribes. The river was the lifeblood of these tribes. It was the source of their prosperity, but it was also a source of great danger. If there was not enough water in the river, there was drought and people starved to death. If there was too much water in the river, then the river overflowed, flooding villages and fields and granaries, and again people starved to death. There was nothing that the small independent tribes could do about these problems, because each tribe commanded just a very small part of the river that could mobilize only a few hundred people to dig canals and, big dam and build dams and so forth. This was one of the main reasons why the small tribes coalesced to form large kingdoms and nations. And these nations now commanded thousands of kilometers and millions of people. And they could build the large dams and canals and reservoirs and granaries that helped humans control the river and that increased the security and prosperity of the people who lived in these kingdoms and in these nations. And indeed, for thousands of years, nations provided people with many essential services and with a greater degree of security and of prosperity. The milder forms of nationalism and patriotism have been among the most benevolent of human creations because they enabled cooperation between strangers. They enabled me to care about people that I never met and never will meet and to cooperate effectively with them towards common goals. And this was very good. Some people imagine 
that without nationalism, we will all be living in a peaceful paradise. But actually, far more likely, without nationalism, we would be living in tribal chaos. And indeed, if you look today at the world, then most of the peaceful and prosperous nations of the world, like Sweden and Switzerland and Japan, they have a very strong sense of nationalism. Countries that don't have a strong sense of nationalism, like Afghanistan and Somalia and Congo, are usually chaotic and poor. So the key question to ask about the role of nations and nationalism in the 21st century is whether nations are still the right framework to address our main problems and opportunities and to ensure the security and prosperity of humans. And the answer is no. Nations are no longer the right framework. Nations today in the 21st century are like the small independent tribes that lived along the Indus Valley 5,000 years ago. We, all humans now on Earth, we now live along a single global river, a river of information, of scientific discoveries, and of technological inventions. This river is the source of our prosperity but it is also a great threat to human civilization and to the survival of the human species. No nation can hope to regulate this river of information and inventions by itself. All the big challenges we now face are global in nature, and therefore they demand global solutions. These are the nuclear challenge, the ecological challenge, and the challenge of disruptive technologies. So let's start by looking at the nuclear challenge, which is the most familiar challenge to us because it has been with us since 1945. Since the 1950s and 60s, it has become very clear that no single nation can protect itself or the world against the nuclear danger. During the Cold War, many people believed that humankind is simply incapable of rising up to the challenge of nuclear weapons. And they thought that sooner or later, the Cold War will turn into a very hot nuclear war, which will destroy human civilization and much of life on Earth. As we all know, this did not happen. Humankind managed, at least until today, to prevent nuclear war, and the Cold War actually ended peacefully. But this was not due to the actions of a single nation like the United States. It was due to the collective action of many nations the US and the Soviet Union and China and India and the Non-Aligned Movement, they all contributed to changing the most fundamental rules of geopolitics. For thousands of years, war seemed to be an inevitable and natural part of international relations. War was the standard tool that every country used in order to advance its interests. But since 1945, thanks to the combined actions of many nations, war has been declining. Since 1945, there has not been a single war between great powers. Few borders have been redrawn through naked aggression, and many countries not all countries, but many countries simply stopped using war as a standard political tool. In 2017, last year, despite horrendous conflicts in some hotspots like Syria and Yemen and Ukraine, 
Actually, fewer people died in 2017 from human violence than from obesity or car accidents or suicide. For the first time in history, you are now your own worst enemies. You have a greater chance of killing yourself. <laughs> Statistically, you have a greater chance of killing yourself than of being killed by any soldier or terrorist or criminal. Sugar is now a greater danger than gunpowder. And you're more likely to die from drinking too much Coca-Cola than from being blown up by Al-Qaeda. And this is all very good news. But there is no insurance, there is no guarantee that this will continue. We have to safeguard this amazing achievement in the coming decades. The reason that humankind avoided nuclear war and that war in general declined, it wasn't because some god came to our help. It wasn't because of some divine miracles. It was because of human wisdom. Humans making wise and good decisions. But there is no guarantee that we will continue to make wise decisions. We, or at least some of us, and some of our leaders, might start making very stupid decisions. You should never underestimate human stupidity. As a historian, I can tell you that human stupidity has been one of the most powerful forces in history. And it is still a very powerful force. So, in order to ensure the survival and prosperity of human civilization in the 21st century, we need to continue privileging the prevention of nuclear war over the interests of any one particular nation. Zealous nationalists who cry, my country first, my country is the most important, they should ask themselves, how can your country, by itself, without the help of a robust system of international cooperation, how can it protect itself and the world from nuclear war? It cannot. The second big global challenge that we are facing is the ecological challenge. We are destabilizing the ecological system to such a degree that we now face the danger of climate change and of ecological collapse. For thousands of years, Homo sapiens proved itself to be an ecological serial killer. We have been responsible for the extinction of numerous animals and plants and other organisms. Now we are putting in danger the survival of our own species, as well as of much of life on Earth. And whereas nuclear war is just a future potential, it might happen, but not yet, didn't happen yet, climate change and ecological collapse are a present reality. It is already happening all around us. And in, if, if things continue in the present course, in 50 years, it might be impossible to live in Mumbai, either because the Indian Ocean will rise and swallow up much of the city, or because it will be so hot that nobody could live here, at least not in the hot season of March and April and May. And this is something that no single nation can prevent by itself, however powerful. Because nations are not ecologically sovereign. India, for example, is a very powerful nation, but it is not an independent nation when it comes to the ecology. Ecologically, it is dependent on what other countries are doing. There are many things that the Indian government can do to help slow down or prevent climate change. It can raise taxes on carbon emissions. 
it can encourage the switch from fossil fuels to renewable energy. It can invest in research and development in the relevant fields. But all these policies, good policies, if they are adopted only by the government of India and China and Russia and the US and so forth continue with business as usual, then Mumbai will still be destroyed. To save itself from ecological disaster, there is a need for global cooperation. But the biggest challenge of all is probably the third challenge of technological disruption. In the coming decades, artificial intelligence and bioengineering are going to create enormous new opportunities as well as enormous new problems. To give a few examples, one prominent example is that the rise of artificial intelligence might completely disrupt the global job market. As AI and computers and robots outperform humans in more and more jobs, in more and more tasks, billions of people might be pushed out of the job market, and we will see the creation of an enormous new class, the useless class. <laughs> Just as the Industrial Revolution in the 19th century created the urban working class, the automation revolution of the 21st century might create the useless class. Now, useless, not from the viewpoint of their mother or husband or children, no human is ever useless from the viewpoint of their loved ones, but useless from the viewpoint of the economic and political system. We might have millions, hundreds of millions of people who have no economic value and therefore also no political power. And this is extremely dangerous. There are all kinds of ideas what to do about this. One popular idea is to have universal basic income. The government will tax the big corporations who will become very wealthy from all these robots and computers and use the, these taxes to provide unemployed workers with basic income or basic services. Now, this is a very interesting idea, but to be effective, it must be implemented on a global level not on a national level, because the automation revolution will have very different impact on different regions and nations. Some regions, like the high-tech hubs of Silicon Valley, will become fabulously wealthy, even much more wealthy than they are today. But other regions, other countries, that today depend on cheap manual labor might completely collapse. And then the question is, do you think that American voters and taxpayers will agree that the US government will raise taxes on Apple and Google and Microsoft in California and then send the money to Bangladesh to pay unemployed textile workers in Dhaka? This is extremely unlikely. But if we don't have a global solution to this problem, then yes, some nations might be very rich, but other nations could completely collapse. And the resulting chaos and violence and immigration waves will destabilize the entire world. Another global problem created by the new technologies might be the development of autonomous weapon systems, killer robots. This is one of the most dangerous technological developments. But again, no nation can prevent this from happening by itself, because no nation has a monopoly over science and technology and the research and development in relevant fields. If one nation, let's say the US, places a ban on the development of killer robots. But other nations 
like China or Russia develop such weapons, then very soon the US itself will feel compelled to break its own ban because it wouldn't like to stay behind, especially in a xenophobic dog-eats-dog -dog world. Even if one country chooses a high-risk, high-gain technological path, nobody could afford to remain behind. Everybody will be forced to follow. So if we want to avoid such a race to the bottom that endangers all of humanity, we need some kind of global loyalty and global identity. But maybe the most important impact of the new technologies is that they will change the very meaning of humanity and they will change the basic rules of the game of life. For four billion years, that's a very long time, four billion years, nothing fundamental changed in the basic rules of life. All of life for this immense period was subject to the laws of natural selection and of organic biochemistry. It doesn't matter if you were an amoeba or a dinosaur, a banana plant or a homo sapiens. You were made of organic compounds and you evolved by natural selection. This did not change. But in the coming decades, it is going to change. Science is about to replace natural selection with intelligent design as the chief motor of evolution, not the intelligent design of some god above the clouds, but our intelligent design and the intelligent design of our clouds, the IBM cloud, the Google cloud, they will be the driving forces of evolution. And at the same time, life is about to break out of the limited organic realm and start spreading into the vastness of the inorganic realm. We are about to create the first inorganic life forms after four billion years of evolution. And in the process, our own species, Homo sapiens, is likely to disappear, not because we will destroy ourselves, but because we will change and upgrade ourselves into something very different. In a century or two, Earth will probably be dominated by entities that are far more different from us than we are different from Neanderthals or from chimpanzees. Today we still share with Neanderthals and chimpanzees most of our bodily structures, of our physical abilities, and of our mental faculties. Our hands, our eyes, our brains, our social relations, our emotions, they are very similar to those of other apes and other mammals. But within a century or two, the combination of artificial intelligence and bioengineering will create completely new bodily and physical and mental traits that completely break from the hominid and mammalian mold. Consciousness itself might be disconnected from any organic structure, or alternatively, we might see the decoupling of intelligence from consciousness. And Earth will be dominated by entities that are super intelligent, but completely non-conscious highly intelligent computer programs that have no minds, no feelings, no emotions. So really, humankind is about to gain divine powers of creation. We are in the process of becoming gods. And the big question that faces us in the coming decades is what to do with our new godlike powers. 
We need ethical guidelines and goals. And nationalism just cannot provide us with the necessary guidelines and goals because it thinks on the completely wrong level. It thinks on a different level. Nationalism thinks on the level of territorial conflicts between nations lasting decades and centuries, like the conflict between India and Pakistan, or between Israel and the Arab world. But here, we are talking about cosmic processes lasting billions of years. We talk about the end of one cosmic process, organic life evolving by natural selection, and the beginning of a completely new cosmic process, inorganic life, shaped by intelligent design. What has Israeli nationalism to say about it? What has Indian or French or Russian nationalism to say about it? Nothing, because they are thinking on the wrong level. To address this kind of questions, we need a cosmic, not a nationalist perspective. To conclude then, the basic idea of, of this talk is very simple, that global problems need global solutions. And nationalism just cannot provide us with the necessary solutions. It does not mean that nationalism has no role to play in the 21st century, or that we should abolish all nations and turn humankind into some kind of homogeneous gray goo. There is still plenty of room in the world for the good kind of patriotism that celebrates the uniqueness of my nation and my special obligations towards it. But we shouldn't confuse being unique with being supreme. Yes, my nation is unique, every nation is unique, and I have special obligations towards it, but it doesn't make my nation supreme, and it doesn't deny the fact that I have obligations towards other groups as well. In order to survive and flourish in the 21st century, humankind, humans, must complement their national loyalties with an obligation, with a loyalty towards a global community. And a person can and should have loyalty simultaneously to many groups. Even today, a person can and should be loyal to her family, her profession, her neighborhood, and her nation. So why not add humankind and planet Earth to this list? It, now, of course, it's true that when you have multiple identities and multiple loyalties, sometimes there are conflicts. But whoever told you that life was simple? Deal with it. It's difficult. In the past, nations evolved because humans had problems they couldn't solve on the local tribal level. In the 21st century, nations are like the old tribes. They are no longer the right framework to address our most important problems. We are already living in a global world. We have a global ecology, we have a global economy, and we have global science. But we still have only nationalist politics. And this mismatch prevents the political system from countering our main problems. To have effective politics, we need to do either of two things. Either we deglobalize the ecology, the economy, the science, we make them local, or we globalize our politics. Now, it is obviously utterly impossible to, to deglobalize the ecology and the march of science. And it will be extremely costly to deglobalize the economy. Therefore, the only real solution is to globalize our politics. Thank you.
So you talked about um, globalizing politics. Um, I, I want to talk the first question on that. Mm -hmm. Is war really obsolete? I mean, what do you have to say about all this mm -hmm. talk of my nuclear button is bigger than your <laughs> nuclear button? Well, war is not obsolete in the sense that it can erupt any moment. And I come from the Middle East, so I know perfectly well that there are still some very violent parts in the world today. War has been declining over the last few decades, but as I said, it, it's not because of some miracle, it's not because of some law of nature, it's because of wise human decisions. And if humans start making stupid decisions, war will global come Global stupidity. Hmm? Global stupidity. Global, again, you don't need global stupidity. When it comes to wisdom, you need global wisdom. When it comes to stupidity, one is enough. <laughs> we, seem to have, we seem to have two. I don't know who, are talking, who you're talking about, but... Uh... <laughs> okay. Um, how do you think politics can be globalized? Are you thinking of a more empowered UN? What kind of models of global governance have you got in mind? Well, the, the key issue is not to try and build some global government or to empower the, the UN. It's, it's probably going to be difficult, if not in, in, impossible. The main issue is for people in every country to start caring and privileging uh, global questions. You can have a, a, a political party in Israel or in India or in the US which is part, a main part of, his, of its agenda is to address global issues, uh, especially out of the understanding that this affects our nation too, this affects our country too. Um, people, it's really a question of, of, you know, what do you care about, what do you think about? In the same way that you can have religious parties and you can care very deeply about religious questions, so you can care in the same way about global warming, or about uh, the danger of uh, uh, killer robots. No, so how do you propose in a world like today when so many of us are fighting over micro-identities, even in our own countries, I mean, you suffer it in Israel, we suffer in India, how do you think we can encourage a loyalty to humankind? Oh, there are so many things you can do. I mean, I'm an historian, so one of the things I can suggest is start teaching in school the history of humankind and not just the history of your nation or your culture or your religion. I mean, if, if a child from early age gets used to thinking about everything in terms of what happened to my nation, how is this affecting my nation, then it's, it's not a big surprise that when this child grows up, he or she still thinks about the world all the time in terms of my nation. But if from early age you're used to, you're, you learn the story of humankind as well as the story of your particular group, this can change the way that people think also about present problems. Isn't this quite difficult? Because I mean, I don't know whether you're facing it in Israel, but we face this problem in India where history is constantly rewritten depending on which government is in power. So children are actually quite confused. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's a very common problem. I think that in much of the world, what people call history is actually mythology. And people have a very difficult time distinguishing history from mythology. And, you know, in other fields of science, the scientists have important authority. Like if you want to build a nuclear bomb, you go to nuclear physicists. You have respect to what these nuclear physicists are telling you. Mm -hmm. But with history, in most countries, nobody wants to really listen to the historians because they are the most problematic <laughs> when it comes to national history. Like they have a, a habit of um, dispelling, of undermining your most favorite stories and mythologies. So is it true that you think that some of the most um, favorite stories, like the Bible, is one of the precursors of fake news? 
Yes, um, <laughs> I'm basically, you know, with all the talk today about fake news, some fake news lasts forever. <laughs> it's just... If a thousand people believe it for one month, it's fake news. If millions of people believe it for a thousand years, that's not fake news. That's the truth, or that's the religious truth, or, or whatever. Now, I'm not saying that all religions or all religious texts are fables. There is sometimes a lot of truth and a lot of very deep wisdom in some of these texts and stories. But we need to be able to distinguish more clearly reality from fiction. And this is something that we do in physics, and this is something that we do in medicine, but when it comes to history, a lot of people, and especially a lot of, of politicians, they don't want to distinguish reality from fiction. So I'm going to take you down a very contentious issue. One of our most fam famous mythologies is the Ramayana, and it talks about a bridge between India and Sri Lanka. And with the new god, Google has proven that this bridge actually existed or does exist. So what would you say to that? Now that's mythology and science and fiction, everything kind of coming together. So where is well, the... I, mean, it's, I think the, the, the test is very simple. If you have evidence, then I'm willing to believe. If you don't have any evidence, then I'm skeptical. Again, not everything that... So the Ramayan is real, guys. The no, Ramayan no, no, no. is so real. It doesn't mean, I mean, one true fact doesn't mean that everything is, is true. <laughs> I mean, if I take the Bible, for example, so there are many incidents mentioned in the Bible that we have today very strong historical and archaeological evidence saying that this really happened. Correct. Like uh, the Bible says that the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar destroyed Jerusalem and the temple in Jerusalem. And we have very strong evidence that this is true. But for events in the Garden of Eden with the Eve and the serpent and all that, that's a bit... Exaggerated. <laughs> uh, that's a bit more difficult. How do religious leaders react to some of your conclusions? Um, depending on whom. I mean, some are very open-minded and some are closed-minded. I mean, I think that you cannot generalize about any group of people, and that's true also about religious people or about religious leaders. Um, so I can't really make a generalization. I have encountered some very religious people in Israel who are extremely open, and also have encountered some secular people who are very close-minded. So it depends on the person, not on the, on the views of the world. So do you believe in God? No. Okay, so you don't believe in God. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the word is problematic. There are two kinds of gods in the world. Uh, and people tend to mix them. There is one God, the mystery God, about which we know nothing. The chief characteristic of this God is that he is mysterious, and humans can't understand and can't say anything about this God. And like people ask, I mean, who, who uh, started the Big Bang? Or how did life start? And all the things that science doesn't know, people say, oh, this is God. And this is a mysterious God. The chief characteristic of the mysterious God is that we know nothing about him or her or it, and I'm perfectly happy with this God. Then there is a completely opposite kind of God, the concrete lawgiver God. And about this God, we know far too much. We know exactly what this God thinks about female fashion, <laughs> about human sexuality, about who should you vote on election, everything. And it's like, it's like a magic trick that you have a magician that tries to fool you, shows you one card, and then you don't notice it changes the card to some other card. So it's the same with God. When you ask people about God, they say, oh, it's a big mystery, it's a big mystery, and we don't know, and science can't explain this and that. Okay. And somehow they then switch gods. And because of this, women should put a hat on their head 
and two men shouldn't have sex with one another, and you should vote for this party or that party. And this is the dangerous trick. And this is the God in which I don't believe. I think that the, if there is a false, if there is a false responsible for the great mystery of life and the universe and the black holes and the galaxies, I don't think he really cares about female dress code. Can we, can we talk a little bit more about this force? Um, you are somebody who practices a vipassana. Um, does that help you get closer to the force? Is that where you get closer to the force? I practice vipassana meditation to see reality more clearly to be able to see what is reality, what is really happening right here, right now. I'm not doing it as any kind of religious exercise to get in touch with this force or that force, with this story or that story. It's really for me then the least dogmatic thing I ever encountered in life is Vipassana meditation. It just tells you, just observe what is really happening right now as it is without trying to impose any story on it, without trying to change it in any way. I mean, I remember the first time I went to a course and the first instruction I got from the teacher was observe your breath. Not observe God, not observe the soul, just observe your breath coming in and out of your nostrils and just accept the breath, whatever it is. If it is strong, if it's weak, if it comes from this nostril or that nostril, it doesn't matter. Just observe the reality as it is. And what amazed me was that I couldn't do it for more than 10 seconds. Immediately the mind ran away to some story, some fantasy, some memory. If I can't observe the reality of my own breath for 10 seconds, how can I hope to observe the reality of the global political system, of the global economic system. So that's exactly the question. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, I, I try, I try to do both. I've been practicing for 18 years now. Wow. And uh, it's been very hell. I don't think more I could than 10 seconds now. More than 10 seconds, I try. So how, how <laughs> Sometimes about? I succeed. I, um, this year I went to a 60 days course here wow. in India. Uh, I, 60 days. 60 days. I didn't stay focused for 60 days, of course. The mind keeps running away, but keep trying. And I don't think I could have written any of my books without the help of, of the focus and the discipline the, and, the, and the clarity that this kind of meditation uh, gives. So when you're deep in meditation, I'm dying to ask this question, and we have quite a lot of people from Bollywood here today, so they've obviously seen some of these films. Does everything start looking like in algorithms and codes, like in Matrix, no, you know, no, when no. he evolves? <laughs> you have a pain in the stomach and your knee hurts, oh, and no. <laughs> then the mind runs away to some memory that, oh, I should have said this, I should have th said that. And this is how you get to know yourself. I, I, think, I think many people, make a mistake about meditation, that they think meditation is a tool to get all kinds of special experiences. Mm -hmm. Like I go to an amusement park, and this is another kind of amusement park. I'll use meditation to have all kinds of special experiences. And actually, I think the most important benefit of meditation is to get to know the most ordinary daily natural patterns of your mind and of your body to get to know your anger, your pain, your joy, your, your boredom, because it's, this is what you have to deal with li in life. If meditation is a kind of vacation, like for a couple of days I have these special experiences, but then for most of the year I still have to deal with my anger and my boredom, it didn't really help me. Is this the purpose of life? Is this the purpose of life? Um, As you see it. Well, I, I think that the, the key to a good life is to be able to observe reality as it is. To really under, what, what is the truth about myself and about the world? 
without running away to all kinds of fantasies and stories and fictions. And I think if you can observe to some degree reality as it is, you're not just, you won't just be a much better person, but you'll probably be a much more peaceful and happy person because the deep source of so much of our personal and collective problems is in the fantasies that we create and then we mistake them from reality for reality and then we try to impose them on reality and we get extremely upset when it doesn't work when reality doesn't conform to our favorite fantasy but it's also part of the paradox because what you're saying is sit quietly in meditation go in and then we have all this technology constantly calling out to us i mean everyone here i'm sure would agree with me that if your phone is away from you for five minutes you're like where's my phone where's my phone where's my phone you're checking your phone at least well, 80 times a day exactly so, so observe that when I mean, what's happening to you when you are away from your phone what's happening in your body you will see that there are a lot of unpleasant sensations in your body at the time what's happening in your mind this is how you get to know yourself you get to know yourself not by observing some blissful, uh, uh, metaphysical, mystical experience. You get to know yourself by observing what happens to me when, when the phone is away. And once you witness how much misery I am inflicting on myself by my own habits, this can help you in um, changing these harmful habits. So one of the things you've said before is that suffering is a sign of consciousness. If something suffers, then it's real and it's conscious. Then is our purpose to suffer rather no, no, than be no. happy? <laughs> Certainly not. I'm not saying that we are here to suffer. We try to be, we can liberate ourselves from suffering. What I said in, in some of what I wrote is that the best test to know whether an entity is real or whether it's a fiction invented by politicians and, and, and religious leaders and so forth is to ask, can this entity suffer? A nation, for example, is just a human creation. It's a fictional story created by humans. How do you know? Just ask yourself, can a nation suffer? If you lose a war, does the nation suffer? No. The nation has no mind, no feelings, no sensations. Soldiers who die in war, they suffer. Civilians who lose their house or their loved ones in war, they suffer. Animals can suffer, but a nation cannot suffer. It's just a story we created. So this is the, 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 the idea of the test of suffering as a test to know whether something is real or not. Similarly, I don't know, if you have some temple mm -hmm. and somebody destroys the temple, the temple doesn't suffer. Only people suffer. The people who care about this temple, when they hear that it is destroyed, they have a very unpleasant sensation in the body. They have very unpleasant emotions in the mind. They suffer. But the temple, it's, it's just, you know, stones and bricks and wood and so forth. But it represents a certain amount of emotions. Now, there's a yes. temple in Israel which is connected to everything. We have a temple here as well which is kind of connected to everything. So Yeah, but we invest the temple with importance. We suffer when the temple is destroyed. We rejoice when the temple is built. It's really about us not about the temple. And I would say also to people in Israel who care very much about the temple, that the deep purpose of a place like a temple is to bring peace and harmony to the world. To make people, I go to a temple to experience peace and harmony. Now, if a temple brings violence and disharmony to the world, it's a broken temple. What do you need it for? Thank you. So I'm going to switch tracks. I'm going to ask you, what does the next entity 
that is not human look like? By definition, we cannot say beyond our imagination. Anything that we today can imagine and understand, it's still on the same level of us as us. Mm -hmm. The next phase of evolution, the next kind of entities, they are beyond our imagination. It's just like if you go 200,000 years to the past and you meet a bunch of Neanderthals and you try to explain to them the modern world, they won't understand you. You try to explain to them, I don't know, the global economic system. We have corporations and they have shares which are ex which exchange in the stock exchange and you can use money to buy these shares and become very wealthy and then the Neanderthals will go, what? What are you talking about? We understand what a an elephant is or what a, a, a giraffe is, but what is a corporation? What is, they can't understand this. In a similar way, we cannot understand the type of entities and societies that will dominate the world in, say, two or three centuries. So let's say it goes in stages. It doesn't just happen overnight. And you have access to biotech and intelligent design. What are the few things you will augment in yourself? What to augment in myself? Um, I think the key issue is that, and this is also the big danger, we just don't understand ourselves well enough in order to uh, answer this question in a responsible way. I can have all kinds of fantasies about changing my body and upgrading my, my brain and my mind. We don't really understand what the consequences will be. And this is, again, one of the big dangers that I didn't have time to address in, in my talk, that in the past, humans had the ability to manipulate the world outside them, but they didn't understand the complexity of the ecological system. So all the changes we made in the world have caused ecological collapse. Mm -hmm. And we might do the same thing inside. We will gain the ability to manipulate our bodies, our brains, our emotions, our minds, but because we don't understand the complexity of the human body and especially the human mind, all these changes might result in an internal ecological collapse, in a mental collapse. So my hope for myself is first to understand my inner world before I start manipulating and upgrading it. Okay, that's fantastic. So I, I want to get a little bit onto the biotech side. Um, I want to ask, what do you mean when you say we'll be able to hack into a human? Well, the, the, the basic wisdom today in the life sciences is that humans have an, a biochemical operating system. Uh, our desires, our decisions, our feelings, they are not the result of some free will or of some metaphysical spirit. They are the result of biochemical processes in the body and in the brain. Until today, we didn't have enough <clears throat> knowledge and information to understand it. So the human body was like a black box. We don't know what's happening inside. But we are now gaining the biological understanding and the computing power necessary to hack human beings. People talk a lot about hacking, hacking computers and smartphones and bank accounts, but actually the really important thing that is now happening, we are hacking human beings. We are deciphering how the body works, how the brain works, how people make decisions. And very soon, governments and corporations might be in the position that they understand what's happening inside us better than we understand. And therefore, they can manipulate us and control us 
and we won't even realize it. Until today, governments could control your external activities. They could see where you go, what you read, what you say. But they didn't really understand what was happening inside. Very soon, they will be able to understand what is happening inside. And if we are not careful, this will lead to the creation of digital dictatorships, of total surveillance regimes, in which resistance is absolutely impossible. Because if you just think about resisting, they know. Like just think about a place like North Korea in 20 years or 50 years, where everybody has to wear a bracelet, a biometric bracelet, which monitors their blood pressure, their brain activity all the time. And if you listen to a speech by Kim Jong-un and the bracelet identifies the signs of anger, that's the end of you. <laughs> so there has, been, there has been a lot of debate around biometric data in India because we have a new ID card called Aadhaar which takes our fingerprint and it takes the iris scan. Um, it's also linked to our mobile phone, to our bank account, to our voter card, to our PAN card, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and it's mandatory. So most of us have had to succumb to it. Is this the first step towards digital dictatorship? Well, maybe yes and maybe no. Every, no technology is deterministic. Every technology has both positive and negative potential, and it would be foolish to give up all the enormous positive potential of biotechnology just because of the negative scenarios. Uh, just as it would have been foolish to give up the uh, inventions of previous ages just because they could support a dictatorship. Like if you think about, I don't know, radio, so in Nazi Germany, radio was the main propaganda tool of the regime. Like every, every day, Hitler or Goebbels or somebody would go on the radio and give speeches to millions of Germans, and this is how they were brainwashed. Does this mean that radio is bad and we should destroy all radio sets? No. You can use radio for also for a lot of good. And it's the same with the biotechnology. I don't want people to become scared of the technology and to just think they can stop it or abolish it. It won't happen. The key is to understand that we have options. We have political options regarding each technology. And we should be aware of all the possibilities and hopefully make the right choice. Okay. Um, I'd like to throw some questions out to the audience. Um, you throw the, is, is there a question? Okay. So, uh, so my question is, uh, it's not about artificial intelligence, but about natural stupidity, which is, uh, you've touched upon several times. So on the one hand, you say human beings have this incredible capacity to be stupid and, and change the course of the world at times. On the other hand, you just mentioned that we're nothing but a biochemically driven organism and no such thing as free will exists. And in fact, neuroscience has shown that, you know, in the brain actually you can record potentials half a second before we are even aware of our decisions. Mm -hmm. So everything's coming from the subconscious. How do you reconcile the two? And in the future, I mean, should criminals be punished if uh, there's no such thing as free will? Well, I think that science is now uh, proving beyond reasonable doubt that the old concept of free will is, is a myth. That at least in, 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 in the old sense of what free will means, that you have some soul or spirit inside that can make decisions completely free, freely, this has no meaning and no scientific validity. And I think that it will require that we change our legal system from a legal system that is based on the idea of um, responsibility and punishment to 
deterrence, prevention, and correction. Even if there is no free will, it's still a very good idea to put a murderer in prison, I mean, especially if there is no free will, and somebody is proven that he has a tendency to murder, then it's very important to protect society against that. And at the same time, if that person is not ultimately responsible for his gene, for his neurons, for his brain, then what we should strive towards is curing or, or helping this person rather than punishing. So it still means that this person needs to be isolated from society. And there is still also room for deterrence because part of the input that goes into this very complex system is I know that if I do this, I'll be put in prison and this still affects my decisions. So there, even if you don't accept the traditional view of free will, there is still much room for a legal system just based on a different principle. But I think the really deeper understanding with regard to free will is how we relate to our desires and wishes. Um, until now, because of the belief in free will, people tended to give enormous importance to their desires and wishes. This is like the most important thing in the world is what I desire. This is a reflection of, our, of my metaphysical free will. And people, you know, fly to the moon and wage world war because of their desires. And if we realize that these desires are actually the product of processes beyond our control often, and they don't represent anything mystical, they really represent all kinds of biochemical processes in our body, maybe we will be less obsessive about our desires and wishes, which I think will help us to be more responsible and to live a more harmonious and more peaceful life. So the lady in the green, sorry, the lady in the green on in the table in, in the first? Uh, going back to the subject of Ramayana and the mention of the bridge between uh, ancient Ceylon and India, uh, and then Google validating it, would you say that a lot of mythology is based on ancient tribal memory? Well, some mythology certainly preserves ancient facts, ancient events. Now, again, from all over the world, historians and archaeologists have many examples of all kinds of mythologies that preserve such real events, factual events. But again, we need to be very careful. The f every event, every claim, needs to be examined on its own merits. If, as I, in the example I gave before, if I have strong evidence that one thing in the Bible, the Babylonian conquest of Jerusalem, really happened, this doesn't prove that another thing in the Bible, let's say the events in the Garden of Eden, or the Exodus, or some miracle, that they are also true. People very often mix together real events with fictions in order to create myth. Uh, and I guess this is true of the Ramayana and Mahabharata and all other mythologies around the world as well. So a question right to the other side of the uh, room. Only if you can catch it. Yeah, yeah, I got it. Okay, my question is, uh, do you ever see a scenario where a political party's views would resonate across different geographies and different countries, and whether 
there was ever be a situation where one party would rule multiple countries and multiple geographies. It was difficult to hear. What was the... Sorry, I'm, I'm, uh, Rajiv, can you repeat the there question? There was an echo, so... Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, I understand, okay. So the question was about a political party in... in... I'm, I'm saying, uh, do you ever see a scenario where the views or ideologies of a political party would resonate across multiple countries and multiple geographies and where do you see a scenario where a political party would rule multiple countries or geographies? Yes, I mean, we have examples from this from the past. Not all of them are very encouraging, but we have examples like the Communist Party, which was a global party and had branches all, all over the world. And you can also view the universal religions as kind of global movements, global ideological and, and political movements. And so this is certainly not, not impossible. And we've also seen how liberal ideals of human rights and the rule of law and democracy, they also spread between many countries, many nations. So it can happen. But when I talked earlier about globalizing politics, so it's, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have a part as the same party ruling many different countries. It means that all parties are becoming more and more aware of the importance of global issues and of the necessity of addressing global and not just local and national problems. Um, in the same way that you know in the past, like in, in the Middle Ages, rulers did not think that the economy or healthcare was their business. They focused on diplomacy, war, things like that, not on healthcare. And gradually in the modern age, it became part of accepted wisdom in the political system that healthcare is a political issue. And every party should have some policy regarding healthcare. Whether you have a national healthcare system or you have some other kind of system, you have a healthcare policy. And in recent years, we've seen that the ecology has become, again, a new political issue. So what I tried to say earlier, that globalizing politics means that it becomes obvious for everybody in the political system that they must address global problems and not just national problems because the most important problems that affect our nation are global problems which our nation just cannot solve by itself. Which is so difficult to do in a democracy. I mean, we see it in our own country where you have politicians not just working, forget about GLOW, they're not even working for the country, they're working for their state or their constituency. So, you know, isn't this just asking for too much? I don't think it's asking for too much because in the end, their state, their city, their constituency will be impacted by Global warming affects not just the bears in the North Pole, it will affect also Mumbai and Delhi and all parts of India. So it's not a problem there, it's a problem here. And really it's just a question of the stories that people tell and the stories that people think about. Uh, it's just changing the, the kind of stories we, we are engaged with. Again, you, we have a lot of examples, like we mentioned the temples earlier. So you can take a temple in one city and talk about it a lot, and suddenly people all over the country, it becomes a burning issue for them. What, what will happen with this temple? So in the same way, if we care so much about one temple, we should care about uh, all the ice world in the North Pole. We should care about, I, I just heard somebody says that if you destroy one wall in the Middle East, you'll have a, a world war about it. But humans can destroy the great Australian reef barrier. Thousands of kilometers of a unique 
habitat with countless species. We, can de we are destroying it. It's the first habitat that is likely to be completely destroyed is the Great Australian Reef Barrier, thousands of kilometers long. We can destroy it and nobody would give a damn. And this is just because the kind of stories that we tell ourselves and we tell our kids and that we, come, we become used to listening and to worrying about these stories. Um, the gentleman here, Harsh, an AP stable. Do you see that uh, in time to come, everything to do with the mind, the machine or the computer will do, and human will do just things which have to do with the heart? Human will only do things that have to do with the heart, and heart. everything else will be hmm. done by computers and machines. He just wants to yes, fall yes. in love. Um, <laughs> there are two ways to look at it. On the one hand, there is nothing special about the heart and about the human emotional system. It is also, in the end, a biochemical system that computers will be able to hack and to understand and to predict and to manipulate, just like any other thing. And it is already happening right now. Computers are becoming better than humans in identifying human emotions. Like if you want to know how another human is feeling, then you basically analyze data. You look at the face, at the facial expressions, you listen to the tone of voice, you listen to the content of the words, and you know from experience that if you see this kind of expression and this tone of voice, the person is angry or the person is frightened. This is just pattern recognition. And this is something that now computers are becoming better than humans. So we have computers that are able to identify, to recognize emotions better than humans. So down the road, we might have computer psychologists, we might have computer artists that are able to inspire and manipulate human emotions better than any human singer or poet or actor. Because they know the instrument they are playing on. In the end, uh, musicians don't play on a piano or on a guitar. Musicians always play on the human biochemical system. And computers will be able to know this instrument, how to press its buttons, better than almost any musician. So this is one side of, of, of the issue. The other side is that computers are unlikely to have any emotions or feelings of their own. In science fiction movies, very often the plot revolves around a robot or a computer that gains consciousness, starts having emotions and feelings, and then either the human scientist falls in love with the robot or the robot tries to kill all the humans, or both things happen at the same time. Now, this is extremely unlikely, because even though there is an immense development in computer intelligence, so far there has been absolutely no development whatsoever in computer consciousness. Computers don't have minds, don't have emotions. They work in a completely different way than humans. And we have no evidence, no indication that they are on the way to developing consciousness. All these movies about the scientist falling in love with the robot that then tries to kill him and so forth, they are not about robots at all. If you notice, in most of these movies, the scientist is a man and the robot is a woman. And these movies are not about humans being afraid of intelligent robots. They are about men being afraid of intelligent women.
the gentleman under the jib. Under the jib. The gentleman under the jib. Thank you. You come from one of the most interesting projects, if I may say so, in recent uh, human history, which is the last 2,000 years where your people were persecuted and then dispersed all over the world and then persecuted and came back and created a nation and a nation initially that was uh, faced with enemies. But today it is perceived as being one that is oppressing its, uh, its not only its neighbors, but, the but those who lived there. Is there a conversation happening in the way that you are talking about oppressing others and, and this whole concept of nationalism that you're talking about? Or is that sort of debate not happening at all? You mean in Israel? Um, in Israel, there is not a serious conversation about what Israelis are doing to Palestinians. Um, again, this is the power of the, of the story. The Israelis are so captivated by their own story that it's very, very difficult for them to really appreciate and sympathize with contradictory stories. And this is a very big problem. And not just for Israelis, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a universal human problem. When you become very attached to your story, one of the uh, negative consequences is that it becomes very difficult for you to see things from a different perspective. You can talk with extremely intelligent and open-minded people about distant galaxies. And they will be very interested and very open and everything. And then you mention the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and something happens in the brain. Like you press a button and a part of the brain shuts down. And you can't have a really honest and serious conversation. And I think, again, it's, it's in, all, in, in almost all human societies, if you yourself enjoy some kind of hierarchical relations, if you yourself benefit, you have privileges from some kind of a hierarchical situation, uh, then it's very difficult for you to see the reality as it is because it puts in danger your privileges, your position. I'm not saying it's impossible, not in Israel and not in other places. Some people are able to do it, but it is very difficult. So one question uh, at the back. I think we've been ignoring the back, this gentleman. Can you, can you see him at the back? At the back, Tahir, right at the back. Oh. <laughs> it's also a lucky opportunity. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you, in conclusion, you try to uh, explain us that global political influencing leadership can give nearer solution and another inside us within human being, just observing, uh, I'm quoting Vipassana, just observing our breath as it is, as a truth of present moment. And in connection with these two, uh, one ancient uh, astrologer, uh, Nostradamus, in 1600, century of France, uh, predicted that one leader from India will spiritually lead the whole global with good thoughts, positive thoughts. Be careful now. <laughs> <laughs> will uh, give solution and unite the global into a one unity of spirituality. So can you throw light on this? <laughs>
Well, I, I wouldn't trust Nostradamus about anything. Uh, from my, I mean, I, I'm a medievalist, but my, my early expertise was not about artificial intelligence and then cyborgs. It was about medieval history and early modern European history. So I know the background of the writings of Nostradamus, and really, it's not a very good source for understanding the, the, the present world. And um, I don't think that the world needs a single leader that will unite the world and that will uh, kind of messiah. I think that whenever politicians start talking in messianic terms, we should sound the alarm. There are several, there are several like, when, like key words that when you hear a politician uses any of these words, be very careful. Uh, these words are, as I said, like messi messianism, like I will save the world, I'm the savior, very dangerous. Also, when politicians start using words like eternal, like redemption, like purity, these are the three big no-nos, eternal, redemption, and purity. If you hear a politician says, this or that will redeem the purity of our eternal nation, this is like <laughs> head for the exit. So last question here, right in front. Here at the head. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor, for an education, not an evening. So in Sapiens, there's a lovely line that you wrote which says, that we did not domesticate wheat. Wheat domesticated us. I'd love you to amplify a bit more about that, but more importantly, Professor, what do you think will domesticate us next? Yes, I mean, the idea that wheat domesticated us is that, you know, you just need to switch the perspective. Think where wheat was 10,000 years ago and where it is today. 10,000 years ago, wheat was an insignificant weed growing in some small patches of the Middle East. Today, you can go for hundreds and thousands of kilometers in North America, in Australia, in places where no wheat grew, and you encounter nothing but wheat, enormous fields of wheat. It's one of the most successful plants in the history of this planet. How did wheat do it? By enslaving a poor ape, Homo sapiens, that got trapped. And wheat kind of convinced this ape to invest all time and effort in just taking care of this plant. You have millions of people from morning till sunset doing nothing except taking care of wheat plants. Now, how did wheat manipulate or enslave this poor, this poor ape? By promising that if you take care of me and spread me all over the world, your life will be much better. You will have much more food. And this was a trick, because for most people it didn't work. Most people, when they became farmers, they worked much harder than, be, than before, but all the uh, surpluses, all the grains that were produced were monopolized by a small elite of kings and priests and aristocrats. They had a good life, but the peasants who actually toiled in the fields all day, they had a much worse life than before. And this can happen again. Again, we have not this time, not with wheat. Because we've all gone gluten-free. Yeah, or, or we've gone past that. Now we're in the same situation. Then you, you have the new technologies, like the AI. And again, there is this promise. If you invest in me and spread me, your life will be much better. And this might be true for a small elite. But if we are not careful, billions of people 
will actually lose their power and we will create the most unequal societies that, that ever existed. So we should try and learn the lesson from what happened with wheat and try not to repeat it in the 21st century. Thank you. Thank you, um, Professor Yuval Harari. That's been amazing. I want to leave you with one last question. Since everything is about stories, how true is your story? And rate it on your own scale. How true is my story? Yes, the books. Those are stories as books. well. Well, my main recommendation to people is don't take any book, including my own, as kind of the truth about history or about humankind. I see my own books more as an invitation to further research. They are more about the questions than the answers. My hope is that they will inspire people to question, to have discussions, to investigate further, and not just to say, oh, okay, this is the truth, now we know everything, we don't need to continue with the investigation. And certainly I don't, for myself, personally, I'm very afraid of being placed in the position of a kind of a guru that knows everything, because the danger is that I might start believe that. <laughs> you know, it goes up to the head, and this is the greatest stupidity of all. So let's test him with a very, very loud hand where he can believe he is a guru. Thank you very much.